This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. If you're listening on Friday afternoon, congratulations on finding us in our new slot. And what did you think of the extended World at One? In feedback this week, the editor of Watto tells us what cornucopia of delights he has in store for his listeners, now that he has an extra 15 minutes to play with. But before that, can you tell me what is making this sound? Anyone? No? Well, next question. Who is being described here? And I'll give you a clue. It's not John Humphreys. He's really hot. <laughs> I love his songs. Yeah. But, and yeah. also, he's signed by Usher. That's yeah. quite a big thing. <laughs> he's signed by Usher. <laughs> Sorry, John. All will be revealed later in the programme. But first, the Radio 4 afternoon schedule changes, which have just come into effect, and the key to which has been the extension of the World at One to 45 minutes. It's so far so good for feedback listener Frederick Cowell. I think it's an excellent decision. On the first day that the news bulletin was extended, it enabled them to have in-depth interviews with Nick Clegg and Bill Gates. This just wouldn't have been possible in the half-hour format of the programme, and we were able to get some in-depth analysis about both the financial crisis and business after the recession. But many of you remain unconvinced of the need for those 15 extra minutes. Rosebury Harbridge speaks for many when she says... There's three hours of today, an hour of news on PM, and then there's six o'clock news. Let's be balanced about this. But Betsy Everett wants to know, what's all the fuss about Watto? What's the matter with everybody? There's so much going on in the world at the moment that we need more in-depth analysis and explanation, especially in the midday slot. The world's teetering on the edge of financial meltdown. There's massive unrest throughout the Arab world, demonstrations and riots on the streets, and the great Radio 4 whingers complain about a bit of rescheduling. Now, some people won't like that. Betsy's husband, Ian, for example. I think she is most unfair to put down the complaints to people with a short attention spans and the usual Radio 4 whingers. There may well be people with perfectly good attention spans but who only have a short lunch hour. Furthermore, you might like to know that this response is due to my inability to stop a reflex response to disagree with everything my wife says or so she says, you might like to take note of that. One telephone call to our house will always produce a perfect balance of opinions on any subject. So is that what the new extended news programme will deliver? To find out what the World at One plans to do with this gift of extra time, I went to talk to Nick Sutton, the programme's editor. I started by asking him how long the idea of extending his programme had been on the cards. I think Gwyn Williams came in with the sort of idea that she wanted to extend the programme. So actually, when I was being interviewed for the job, she was asking me then about it. I've been in the job since last December. She was asking me then about what I thought about extending the programme. So I think this is something that she clearly intended to do. But did she give you any more money? Has your budget gone up? Have you got more journalists to provide this extra 15 minutes? Yes, It's gone up by £100,000, which pays for one journalist and a bit more and additional coverage to reach some of the sort of ambitious things that we want to do. But some people, one of our listeners in particular, Jonathan Flack, says, "Ah, hold on a second. Uh, You know, the BBC says Radio 5 is the home of live news. It's not as if the BBC doesn't have outlets for news. All of the Today programme through, your programme, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 10.30... Uh, Radio 4 is not starved of news, so what are you going to do with this extra time? Well, just just going back to the sort of starved of news point, I think the audience figures and the audience research suggests that there's a real appetite for it. Our audience is up 10% on a year ago. Every day, about a quarter of a million people tune in to Radio 4 at 1 o'clock for our programme. And I think people want our programme to be there to explain some of the sort of complex stories that are around at the moment. Oh, I'm sure they want your programme. The question is whether they want it at that length, because, as you know, James Boyle, a previous controller, took the decision to reduce it. Uh, People understand, of course, that at certain moments when there is a lot of news and developing stories, you want to expand that 30 minutes. But they say, actually, the number of times that happens is much less than people think. And a lot of the time, you're filling this space with stories that we've heard before on the Today programme, which are often far too obsessed, for example, with the Westminster village. Well, 
I do want to do a slightly broader range of stories. I think there's been a danger with Watteau in the past that it's been too dry, too concentrated sometimes on Westminster, although I don't quite buy the argument that it's Westminster at one. So could we discuss the structure of the newly elongated world at one? Is it the same as before, but just extended? Or can you block it out for us? Yeah, of course. Um, The news bulletin at the top of the programme used to be four and a half minutes, and we're extending that to six minutes. Um, That enables the the news at the top of the programme to cover a slightly wider range of stories, probably one or two extra stories a day, which I think listeners, I hope, will appreciate. Um, The other thing is that, as well as allowing interviews a bit more time to breathe when appropriate, without them getting flabby, which, again, I don't want to happen, I think we should be able to run probably one or two more items in the extra 15 minutes. I mean, just over the last few days, the sorts of things we've been able to do that we wouldn't have been able to do before were things like an interview with Ai Weiwei on Monday's programme, an interview with Bill Gates on Monday's programme, where he was talking about the situation... Well, you wouldn't have done it before. If you'd been offered in a half-hour Watto programme with either of those two people, Bill Gates or Ai Weiwei, and you'd say, you'd turn them down? I don't think we'd have had the time to have done it. You know, that that was among the mix of things... You wouldn't have run the interviews at all. You do surprise me. We wouldn't have run them at the same length that we did, and... I'm not sure we necessarily would have done. You know, the Ai Weiwei story that we did on Monday, I don't think would have we would have considered was one of the top sort of three stories on that day. Um, one of the things that listeners and correspondents you have consistently said is they don't like it when our presenters cut off guests mid-flow. So one of the things I hope we'll be able to do is run interviews slightly longer where, where necessary. We did quite a lot of audience research beforehand, speaking to about sort of 900 listeners, and they had quite a broad range of additional sort of types of stories that they wanted us to do. And, so and what sort of stories do they want you to do that they don't feel they're getting enough of at the moment? Well, um, there was quite heavily on sort of domestic and international news, but also significant um, majorities wanted more technology news, more business news, uh, a bit more arts and culture news. Interestingly... Um, not, uh, not surprisingly, at the bo- actually sports news, they don't want any more they don't of that. Want more sports so news can, we de- can we assume that uh, Gary Richardson won't do even more? We're Radio not gonna, 4? We won't be having a sports slot. Sorry, Gary. A, I don't think we do it particularly well because... That's what Five Live is great at doing. We don't necessarily even have the contacts to get great guests, so we won't be doing more sports news. Interestingly, particularly among younger audiences, they are quite keen on us doing more arts and culture. When I say younger, this is sort of 35 to 55-year-olds. Basically, some people say these art stories, for example, they're not really stories, they're promotions for exhibitions, films that open, whatever. They're a form of publicity that a lot would, that pretends to be news about the arts isn't. I think that that's right, and I think there's a particular way that we need to do it to make sure that we keep the same rigour that we would have with our sort of normal news coverage. So, actually, before the extension, we did a series on the sort of future of the book, looking at how digital publishing was changing, you know, publishing. I think we'll be able to do a bit more of that sort of thing, which is, you know, arts and culture in a sort of looser sense without just being plugs for the latest exhibition. But I think as long as we carry on doing it with the same rigour and explaining what the news element to the story is, I think it's worth doing. Nick Sutton, editor of The World at One. Do let us know how well you feel the programme is using those precious extra minutes over the coming weeks. We, of course, are disinterested observers. Meanwhile, over on BBC Five Live, the shake-up has been more of a geographical nature. The whole station is gradually upping sticks to Salford, hard by the Manchester Ship Canal. By the end of the month, every programme will come from the shiny new Media City UK building, or BBC North, as it's been called. Victoria Derbyshire is one of the first presenters to start broadcasting from there. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Good morning, it's 10 o'clock on Monday morning. This is Victoria Derbyshire. I met Miss Derbyshire when feedback was in Salford last week and asked her whether being 200 miles from London does make a difference to the sound of her programme. Should it make any difference? It's very similar to broadcasting from studios in London. But that is because our programme is representative of the UK. We want to bring original journalism to our listeners. We want to cover the news and sport extremely well. So why should it be any better or worse because we're 200 miles from where we used to be? And the audience might say, in which case, why on earth move you with all the attendant costs if the programme doesn't sound any different, if it's just the same national programme 
that it would be if it's done from London. Well, that, as you know, is really a question for management, but I will There's do... There's a slight smile on your face, I must tell this to <laughs> Victoria. Now you're being terribly discreet at this point. Well, the rationale, as you know, is that at the moment 90% of licence fee money is spent in the capital, and I don't think anyone would suggest that that was particularly fair. So spreading it out around the country seems a lot fairer. There's also perhaps a perception of, of maybe all of BBC's network radio stations that we are London-centric. Now, whether that is true or not about Five Live, and I suspect it's not, then being in Salford will reduce that perception if anybody had it in the first place. But if any of our listeners can um, hear a difference, you're probably saying they shouldn't. Yes, I think I am. I mean, there may have been a few more references to Salford on air, which you'd expect, because we're all human beings and people have moved and it's different and they're adapting to a, a new life and so on. But that will, that by now, will have disappeared, I'm sure. Miss Derbyshire, now working in Lancashire, or since the 1970s, Greater Manchester. I wonder if there is a lesser one. Now for a new feedback feature, our own version of QI, in which you ask some quite interesting questions and we try and get even more interesting answers. First up, <laughs> have you guessed what that is yet? Listener Dr Stephen Claxon would no doubt have been the first on the buzzer there. As a member of the Scottish Ferret Club, he would have accurately identified that as the sound of a ferret, the sound he thinks should have been heard in a recent episode of The Archers. In The Archers, can we be sure that Daphne isn't Eddie Grundy's guinea pig? The squeaking creature he was feeding in this afternoon's episode certainly didn't sound like a ferret. Ferrets do not usually make much sound. They will squeal if trodden on, but their most normal sound is duking, particularly if they're in a playful mood. Sometimes they will hiss, but they do not squeak. Dr Stephen Claxon, member of the Scottish Ferret Club, Orkney. Not being a fascinated ferret fancier myself, I called on an expert for a second opinion. Anne Robinson, a trustee of the Ferret Education and Research Trust. Um, Anne Robinson, are they given to making lots of noise? Because, of course, a radio drama producer rather relies on his cast being voluble. Yes, ferrets do make a, a lot of sounds. That clip is the traditional duking sound. That's a playful, happy ferret. It's the sort of sound a ferret makes when just full of fun and life and wanting to tell you how happy it is. Well, can we play you this clip from The Archers? Because there's been a question mark raised, obviously, about whether we are about to listen to a ferret or a guinea pig. Please tell right. us. Is that Daphne? Is that tasty, eh? <laughs> that were... Eddie, how many times? What? Will you not feed your ferrets in here? Oh, it's only Daphne. She'll stay on my knee. She's not on the table or anything. Well, you make sure she ends. Mm. And wash your hands after I listening will. with her. You better. So what was it? Hmm, it could have been a ferret. Um, it certainly isn't a ferret duking. It sounds more like a, a squeaky noise to me, so I can see why people might think it was a guinea pig. So why do you think Daphne, which is the archer's ferret, of course, is squeaking rather than duking? Does it sound like Eddie is looking after Daphne properly? I'm sure he is. Ferrets do squeak and screech sometimes when they play. I suspect that Daphne is perhaps um, playing at the time when this was taken, and rather than duking... This is a, um, a fun squeak of a young ferret playing. Anne Robinson, editor of Ferret Time magazine. So, Archer's producers, what do you say to that? We have checked the ferret situation and we can reassure listeners that Daphne is definitely a ferret. The sounds of Eddie Grundy's ferrets were specially recorded on location in the Midlands by the Archer's own technical broadcast assistant. Well, I hope that's clear now. And still on small, fluffy things... Teen pop sensation, Justin Bieber, star of Radio 4. Radio 4? It's Radio 1, which needs a younger audience. The average age of its listeners is well above the target age. It's 32. Yes, absolutely ancient. But is Radio 4 trying to pinch young fans for its PM programme by featuring news about the teenage sensation? A couple of our more mature feedback listeners have their suspicions. Mike Smith. Is PM a serious news outlet or just another magazine programme we don't need? 
I really wonder after Monday night's agenda. It's the most beautiful time well, Eddie, with the global economy on the brink, there are momentous events here also in West London, if you're a teenager. Justin Bieber, the 17-year-old Canadian pop sensation, is performing live at this well-known shopping centre. And in case you're wondering what the collective noun for a lot of Justin Bieber fans is, it's... Justin who? Interviewing live a gang of 13-year-olds who had no more interest in the news than the man in the moon. He's really hot. I love his songs. Yeah. And also, yeah. he's signed by Usher. That's yeah. quite a big thing, Woo! being signed by Usher. You realise you're saying names, I've no idea who these Do you people know who are. Usher is. Oh. Usher. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so old. It's like, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, this is ready for. Look him up, people. Look him up. Stop what, trying to be all things to all people, PM. If PM is a news programme, stick to the news. Well, we tried to get Justin on to feedback, but we couldn't get hold of him. Never mind, he is a bit old. Here's a ten-year-old feedback listener, Jude, to tell you how to contact feedback. You can write to feedback P.O. Box 67234 London S.E. 1P 4AX or leave a phone message on 033334 Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or you can email feedback at bbc.co.uk. All these details are on our website. Bye. Thanks, Jude. Watch out, Justin. Now, as you know, the BBC Trust wants to hear your views on the proposed cuts contained in Delivering Quality First. And there is a separate consultation going on which is garnering your thoughts on local radio. But at the same time, the Trust has also announced a review into the impartiality of the BBC's coverage of the Arab Spring. It's a cold Cairo night and tens of thousands of protesters are still in Tahrir Square in the centre of this city. Reports from Syria suggest at least 15 people have been shot dead during a police crackdown on anti-government protesters in the northern city of Daraa. Syrian officials have blamed the violence on armed gangs. As Syria's revolutionaries face an all-out military assault, there's been condemnation from the West, but little action. The former leader of Libya was hunted down and killed in his hometown, Sirte. He was found cowering in a drainpipe. The Trust has appointed the former Financial Times journalist Edward Mortimer, who later worked for Kofi Annan at the United Nations as Director of Communications, to conduct this review. Mr Mortimer is also a good friend of the chairman of the BBC Trust, Chris Patton. The chair of the BBC Trust's Editorial Standards Committee is Alison Hastings, herself a former regional newspaper editor. Previously, the Trust had carried out three impartiality reviews. So what prompted this, the fourth? Have there been lots of complaints? We don't react, actually, often with these reviews because there's a massive problem, necessarily. It's actually sometimes looking at very normal things that the BBC does and making sure that there's no complacency there. And, so did anything trigger this? Or was it just, you know, your first one, I think, is into business, you had another one into news and current affairs coverage domestically, um, you had another on science... Yeah. Did anything trigger this? The word I'd probably use on this would be topicality, on this particular one, which maybe is a word I wouldn't have used on science, for example. So extraordinary events have occurred in the Middle East, which probably lots of people, if you look back a year, 18 months, weren't really expecting. And then you also combine that with the fact that it's conflicts, complex, fast-moving, the BBC's um, ability to make sure that they're reflecting a broad range of views in a difficult part of the world, both for its domestic audience but also for its global audience. And also because I think, unfortunately, there will be conflicts in the next few years. There may be some learnings that come out of this. We don't know. We're just embarking on but it now that we say, can use. Some would say this is a real hostage for fortune because if you do a review, you have to find something wrong. If you don't find something wrong, it's called a whitewash. If you find something wrong, then a lot of journalists, working with BBC journalists, risking their lives in very difficult situations, feel aggrieved and hurt. And the last time you looked into it, it wasn't a review, but you looked into the Middle East conflict and there was a criticism of Jeremy Bowen. There was a tremendous row. You spent a great deal of money, uh, money on the trust in legal costs and so on. Well, I don't think that the trust or the BBC journalism should shy away from something that might end up having some difficult questions about it and you know let's wait and see I tend to I'm a journalist by background the fact that the BBC is able to 
do in-depth reviews of its content, do audience research. You know, in my background in newspapers, that is such a gift that there's the ability to keep hearing how you're doing to make sure that you're improving. But I'm sure that there's no journalist that wouldn't say that content analysis and audience research, particularly in difficult parts of the world, should be helpful to them. And I'd be disappointed if people didn't feel that they could take that information. We don't know what we're going to hear yet, Roger. So, you know, I think probably the best thing is let's wait and see. Why did you choose Edward Mortimer? Um, we were looking for an individual, I and mean, it's always quite tricky trying to find an individual. You know, you're balancing it with somebody who has some sort of expertise in the field, so that it, it's meaningful, but also somebody that you're not immediately going to accuse of being less than impartial themselves. Although he's a good friend of the chairman, indeed, in the chairman's autobiography or partial autobiography, he talks about him with great um, affection. And that's true, and that's why I was very keen, as was the chairman, to ensure that he wasn't involved at all in the recruitment process of that. So. Uh, he stepped aside and wasn't involved in the decision-making. We're satisfied that Edward Mortimer's reputation academically and his expertise in the Middle East means that he is you know, perfectly well qualified to do this. And, of course, there will be cost. I mean, how much will this cost the licence fee pair? Well, we haven't, obviously embarked on it yet so we're not sure of the ones that we've done in the past the ones that you've mentioned they do vary depending on how much content analysis you have to do on this one for example we've said that we also want to look at some of the coverage on on world news and so that will add to the cost but on science that was 140,000 pounds but if that that's quite a small well a tiny percentage of the budget of BBC News and BBC News is One of its very important roles for audiences is to make sure to ensure that they are impartial over their coverage. Can I ask what impartial means then in this context? I mean, some would say we in the West and in this country, the BBC, are not impartial when it comes to freedom of information, uh, freedom of expression. We're not impartial when it comes to democracy uh, against tyranny. So what does impartiality mean in this context? Um, I think the the obligation for impartiality... covers all sorts of areas, including, I mean, there's, there's, there's obvious ones, is that are you balancing, for example, fact and opinion? Do the audience understand when you are giving them statistically factual information? Do they understand when you're maybe summing up what you think you've just witnessed? If you're using, as will have happened in this case, quite a lot of user-generated content, because in places like Bahrain, often that was the only way that you could get it, have you verified those sources before you've put that on air? I mean, there's a big obligation on the BBC to do that. In your use of language, in your... um, Obviously, accuracy is very important. Are you making sure that you're you're presenting the broad range of spectrum appropriately. And that doesn't always mean that it's got to be 50-50, for example. Yes. I do still feel that there is an audience expectation that the BBC does give them factual information and then they are perfectly capable and perfectly sophisticated enough to make up their own mind as to what they think about that. Trustee Alison Hastings on the impartiality review into the BBC coverage of the Arab Spring. Now, how impartial is this contributor to Thought for the Day? In the harsh winter of two years ago, I heard this heartache from my father, a few weeks after we'd buried my mother together in our local churchyard. For years he had fed her and cared for her and kept her warm. Now I keep worrying about her, he said tearfully, soaked through with the rain, cold under all this snow. My body won't matter a jot to me one day, but it might still matter a lot to those who love me. I have never, thank goodness, needed an organ to save my life or even my quality of life, nor loved anyone dearly who has. But I have known what it is to worry about the lives of my children, and I have lost others I love, so perhaps I can begin to imagine. And the thought of waiting and waiting and waiting for something you can no longer use and I most desperately need fills me with a sympathetic dread. Wednesday's contribution came from novelist and columnist Anne Atkins, who was talking about a proposed law which would require people in Wales to opt out of donating their organs when they die, rather than opting in by signing a register. My father needs to know my mother's body is resting undisturbed. It's a great voluntary gift to bestow life on another by giving your body. But perhaps as an automatic sacrifice, it's terrible. What is at stake... Could it be even more important than life? Now, the Today programme did run interviews with the chairman of Kidney Wales Foundation and with Glyn Davies, the Conservative MP for Montgomeryshire, on the controversial issue in Tuesday's programme. But feedback listener Tony Barrett 
still has concerns about the balance of Wednesday's thought for the day, to which, of course, no one is given the right of reply. So I gave him a call. What was so biased in your view about Anne Atkins' talk? Her use of language. She talked about you wouldn't toss away a baby's body. She talked about the importance for a father to know that a mother um, body was resting undisturbed. It was very much anti-transplant, with the sort of feeling that if you had donated an organ, somehow your body wouldn't rest in peace. Uh, my daughter had cystic fibrosis, and um, she was 31 and a year ago died because a lung transplant wasn't available for her. I suppose uh, she would argue that she was concerned, if you like, with a religious perspective on this, and that what she was saying, that various people, for right or wrong, do care and do worry about the bodies of their loved ones after death, and therefore, because of that, they ought to give their specific consent. Is that not a reasonable position to take? For a religious person, it's a reasonable position to take. It's not reasonable that they're given a platform to express that position with nobody being able to answer it. She said nothing about sort of the desperate need for organs, so it was a very, very biased view. Tony Barrett. We put his concerns to Radio 4, who gave us this statement. The organ donation proposal in Wales was a perfectly legitimate subject, even though it is a contentious issue. What's important is how it's dealt with. Thought for the Day offers a personal view, but it doesn't try to pretend it's the only view. It is one of many. Anne acknowledged that, along with the emotion and heartache for those who find themselves in that situation. Now it's nearly the end of our first 4.30pm programme. Oh, it's just the same 8 o'clock show if you're listening on Sunday night. Uh, the bulk of our correspondence this week has been about the changes to the Radio 4 afternoon schedule, which started on Monday... And we're not finished with that yet. Within the next couple of weeks, I'll be talking to Gwyneth Williams, the controller of Radio 4, about why she made those changes. Do let us have some questions you want answered. We've already heard what some of you think about the extended world at one. What about what follows it at 1.45? This week you've been listening to a series of 15-minute programmes entitled A History of the Brain, but a number of you have pointed out that there may have been a simpler solution to filling this scheduling hole. Brenda Bell. I think that the archers would fit neatly between the world at one and two o'clock when the afternoon play could start. I don't know why they try to find another item to fill in the slot when the archers would be just right. My name's Trisha Lorth and I live in Chichester. I really do like the idea of 45 minute World at One. But when we were listening to it yesterday and it came to the brain program and we were eating our lunch and we we're talking about drilling brains, I thought it's not really appropriate for a lunchtime program. However, I have a solution which I hope that um, someone will consider, which is to move the archers to a quarter to two and then have a whole hour for the afternoon play, which I believe that you used to do, and it, I f always find the afternoon play just a little bit too short, so I hope somebody might consider my suggestions. Thank you. Alternatively, my bank manager has just suggested that we could do two feedbacks a week, one half an hour, one 15 minutes. The additional fee would help wipe out the Bolton family debt, which is becoming positively Italian in its proportions, all without the benefit of bunga bunga. Arrivederci. I prefer to put down the complaints to people with a short attention spans and the usual Radio 4 whinges. There may well be people with perfectly good attention spans but who only have a short lunch hour. Furthermore, you might like to know that this response is due to my inability to stop a reflex response to disagree with everything my wife says, or so she says. You might like to take note of that. <laughs> One telephone call to our house will always produce a perfect balance of opinions on any subject. So is that what the new extended news programme will deliver? To find out what the World at One plans to do with this gift of extra time, I went to talk to Nick Sutton, the programme's editor. I started by asking him how... Yeah. And also, yeah. he's signed by Usher. That's yeah. quite a big thing. <laughs> he's signed by Usher. <laughs> Sorry, John. All will be revealed later in the programme. But first, the Radio 4 afternoon schedule changes, which have just come into effect, and the key to which has been the extension of the World at One to 45 minutes. It's so far so good for feedback listener Frederick Cowell. 
I think it's an excellent decision. On the first day that the news bulletin was extended, it enabled them to have in-depth interviews with Nick Clegg and Bill Gates. This just wouldn't have been possible in the half-hour format of the programme, and we were able to get some in-depth analysis about both the financial crisis and business after the recession. But many of you remain unconvinced of the need for... This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. If you're listening on Friday afternoon, congratulations on finding us in our new slot. And what did you think of the extended World at One? In feedback this week, the editor of Watto tells us what cornucopia of delights he has in store for his listeners, now that he has an extra 15 minutes to play with. But before that, can you tell me what is making this sound? Anyone? No? Well, next question. Who is being described here? And I'll give you a clue. It's not John Humphreys. He's really hot. <laughs> I love his songs. How long the idea of extending his programme had been on the cards. I think Gwyn Williams came in with the sort of idea that she wanted to extend the programme. So actually, when I was being interviewed for the job, she was asking me then about it. I've been in the job since last December. She was asking me then about what I thought about extending the programme. So I think this is something that she clearly intended to do. But did she give you any more money? Has your budget gone up? Have you got more journalists to provide this extra 15 minutes? Yes. It's gone up by £100,000, which pays for one journalist and a bit more and additional coverage to reach some of the sort of ambitious things that we want to do. But some people, one of our listeners in particular, Jonathan Flack, says, ah, hold on a second. Uh, You know, the BBC says Radio 5 is the home of those 15 extra minutes. Rosemary Harbridge speaks for many when she says, there's three hours of today, an hour of news on PM, and then there's six o'clock news. Let's be balanced about this. But Betsy Everett wants to know, what's all the fuss about Watto? What's the matter with everybody? There's so much going on in the world at the moment that we need more in-depth analysis and explanation, especially in the midday slot. The world's teetering on the edge of financial meltdown. There's massive unrest throughout the Arab world, demonstrations and riots on the streets, and the great Radio 4 whingers complain about a bit of rescheduling. Now, some people won't like that. Betsy's husband, Ian, for example. I think she is most unfortunate.